classes in statistical mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 2, Foundation Assumptions, the Basis of Gibbs Statistical Mechanics, by popular demand, the recipe for edible atomic models. 1 cup softened butter, 2.5 cups sugar, 2 eggs, 2 tablespoons cinnamon, 2 tablespoons vanilla, 2.5 cups flour, 2 teaspoons each baking soda and cream of tartar, a quarter of a teaspoon or modestly less table salt, beaten till smooth. Combine with 2 by 12 ounce packages of milk chocolate baking chips. Put in the chips at the end or it's very hard to beat until things are smooth. Form dough into clumps, round and rather larger than a walnut. Roll in a one-to-one -one mixture of granulated sugar and cinnamon. You can use the extra mixture if you have any. A quarter of a cup should be more than enough to sprinkle on top of the cookies before baking. Bake in an unbuttered pan for about 10 minutes at 375 Fahrenheit. Cooking times vary greatly. Uh, you might as well experiment until you get used to discovering what your stove does. In any event, I am Professor Phillies, and this is the ISP on statistical mechanics, especially fluids. Today we are doing Lecture 2. So let us begin, more or less at the beginning, in the last lecture, I discussed a puzzle. And the puzzle was how you could calculate the air pressure in the room uh, without an impossible computer budget and violating other laws of nature, or at least doing things we don't know how to do. The second part of what I did is to discuss statistics. Now, the statistics I discussed were based on rolling dice. And if you roll a die, it comes up on one of six or twenty or a hundred or whatever sides. And those sides are each labeled with an integer. And you could imagine relabeling so that the integer gives you a table of outcomes. Or you could just label the dice with the outcomes. So the die generates a function, but it generates a function that only has a finite or countably infinite number of outcomes. In general, however, you don't have to talk about something that is a function of an integer. That is, instead of saying the in outcomes are labeled with an integer, you could say the outcomes are labeled with a real number. For example, suppose the outcome was the position of this one atom along the x-axis back and forth in the room. Well, that's a number. It's a real number. It's a continuous number, and the outcome could be the position itself, or the outcome could be some function of the position, you know, like the force the mm -hmm. atom is putting on the wall, and now we replace the integer with a real number. Corresponding to replace the integer with a real number, we replace the summation sign, which is an integer, with an integral sign. And we integrate over the variable between some bounds. So that's a change, and I talk about it a bit in chapter 2. But if you're comfortable with calculus, it's a very small change. OK, so that is what we do. And that is probability and statistics. And you have seen means, and you have seen cumulants, and you've seen a discussion of distributions. And in particular, you saw the average of the square minus the square of the average, the root mean square width of a distribution. Mm -hmm. And if you have a distribution, the root mean square tells you something about how wide it is. Now, it doesn't tell you everything. In particular, if the distribution has some shape, the distribution may have a tail, and out here in the tail, the function you calculate may be extremely large. That is, you have some low probability event, 
but if the low probability event contributes a large effect, it may be important even though it's low probability. Recalling that we are in 2012, I call your attention to the 2008 stock market and the phrase is black swan event. It's a low probability event, but if it occurs, it has some remarkable effect. For example, real estate prices falling everywhere in the United States at the same time, which has never occurred before since at least 1980 or 82, when I recall it happening before. Or 1978, when I was in California and real estate prices were dropping like a rock. Uh, however, in any event, we have now talked about probability and statistics. Now let's go back to the question of how we deal with the pressure. The, there was a, an original historical obstacle in physics to dealing with the problem. And the real historical obstacle was that to attempt to deal with the problem, you had to believe in atoms. Now this may seem a little odd at first. After all, Dalton in 1800 had given us the law of definite proportions so that Calcium oxide is CO, hydrogen, water is H2O, hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, and atoms had combining weights, which we can now understand a little more carefully. Dalton, however, was very careful to say that his results did not say anything about the atomic nature of atoms and matter, and he was quite resistant to saying that. Not to mention that there are things called solid solutions in which, so far as you can tell, the ratio of species A to species B can be anything you want because you're actually looking at a mixture, not at a single chemical compound. And that wasn't well understood at first. However, by, oh, 1870s, organic chemists had explained not only the existence of optical isomers, that's Pasteur, and the exist and the, but the existence of chemical reaction chains involving optically active compounds like sugars in terms of the notion that the carbon atom bonded tetrahedrally and huge amounts of data could be systematized that way. It was a totally solid proof of the atomic nature of matter and the structure of molecules. Physicists did not believe in atoms in the 1890s, or at least many German physicists did not. They believed in a somewhat dead philosophy called logical positivism, and they thought everything could be explained in terms of energies. And so we now advance roughly to the 1880s and 1890s, and the first person theoretical physicist to put a huge amount of work into it. Maybe you should say the second, because Maxwell put a considerable amount of work in. However, Maxwell died very young and didn't continue what he was doing. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, assembled a kinetic theory of matter, and it was based, this is a kinetic theory of gases, and it was based on the notion that gases were little balls, and they moved in straight lines and had collisions, like billiard balls. And because they were bouncing off the walls of the room, they created a pressure. This was the kinetic theory of gases. Uh, the kin his kinetic theory of gases had several problems, uh, one of which was that he attempted to explain irreversibility uh, in terms of kinetic theory. And the notion in irreversibility is that if you go in, I'm going to, we're going to break for a second. There. I think we lost, we're losing a bit of image. That was an interrupt of about 10 minutes. It's not there anymore, it should be okay. Okay, in any event, as I was saying, uh, Boltzmann, the notion of irreversibility is that if I drop uh, some dark ink, water-soluble ink, into water, it spreads out and the solution becomes uniform. But we never see the reverse in which the, this gray water separates into pure water and dark ink. 
And the assertion was that the process could only run in one direction, and that this ought to come out of the laws of nature, like uh, Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism and Newton's laws of motion. The problem with this is that Newton's laws of motion and Maxwell's equations have time reversibility, and any process that you see can be equally run in both directions. Uh, in any event, Boltzmann had a somewhat general idea, but not an exact idea, of how to proceed, and he was subject to a great deal of criticism, some of it quite solid and some of it not. For whatever reasons, he finally committed suicide. Uh, his results were not uniformly accepted. Um, Boltzmann, however, Boltzmann's approach at best only works for gases, and it is we have to advance a few years and cross the Atlantic to Yale University and Josiah Willard Gibbs. Gibbs was the greatest American physicist of all times. First, he worked out statistical mechanics correctly. Second, he worked out chemical thermodynamics as opposed to steam engine thermodynamics correctly. He did it purely deductively in a 360-page paper. They didn't quite have page limits the way they do now. And in the course of this, he worked out almost everything in chemical thermodynamics. Finally, he took the question, how do we discuss quantities in physics, and he created vectors and vector products and what we now know about representing things in a sensible way, the way you see in Maxwell's equations. Before he did this, there were not four Maxwell's equations, there were eight, because x, y, and z components each had their own equation. <coughs> So what Gibbs did was to work out a correct representation of how to treat the problem. His representation also works for liquids and solids. It is the only theory that survives intact the tra quantum transition. You have second quantization that changes Maxwell's equations because the electromagnetic field is quantized. You have um, the Schrodinger equation, which replaces F equals MA, but Gibbs' work survived. Okay, so what did Gibbs did do? What he did was to look at this fluctuation problem I talked about and say, we have a circumstance, and we can look at any of these physical quantities, like the pressure on the wall, and we can divide the pressure into two parts an ideal part and a contingent part. He did not use precisely this language. I'm using the language that Aristotle would have used. The ideal part, we have a piece of marble, and it might be a chip of marble, it might be a block straight out of the quarry, it might be a finished statue. Those three pieces are very different, but they each have some essence of marbleness that is common to all of them, that is the ideal part. On the other hand, they also have the contingent part, which lets you tell them apart. And what Gibbs did is to say, we can split these physical quantities into parts, and we can calculate the ideal part, which is roughly what thermodynamics looks at, and we can calculate what in fact are a full set of ideal properties of the contingent parts, the only thing we can't do is calculate exactly what the pressure on the wall of the room is right now. To do that, you have to measure the location of all of the atoms and all of the molecules and how fast they're moving. And we do not know how to do this without recourse to witchcraft and art not taught at this university. So having said that, what did Gibbs do? Well, what Gibbs did is to say, first of all, we have a notion of an average. And here is the average. And the average of a quantity is a sum over all possible outcomes, say, die rolls. The value of the function that we give to the function if we get that die roll times the statistical weight of that die roll. 
and we have this normalizing factor down here which we divide out so that if aj is always equal to say 1 well the average value of 1 ought to be 1, oughtn't it? and with the normalizing factor it did. Then it might be the case, and we're going to go down here instead of the index, the thing that labels the states of the system being a discrete variable, an integer, this is a real variable. And because it's a real variable, instead of having a summation over values of j, you have an integer integral over, you don't have an integer, you have an integral over the value of j, and now script n represents all the values that j can take. a, the thing being averaged, is a function of j, not something that's just labeled with j, W is a label, W is a function of j, not just labeled with j, but we've gone from a sum to an integer, and in a certain sense, we really haven't changed anything. So far, so good? Okay, and now we come to what Gibbs did. And the first thing he did is to say, we are going to discuss, well, canonical ensemble I'll explain in a few moments. And he, we introduce a symbol which we represent as beta, and it's 1 over k sub bt. t is the absolute temperature, the temperature measured from absolute zero, and k sub b is a constant which ident relates our temperature units to our energy units. K sub b has units energy per temperature. So kT is an energy. 1 over kT, or beta, is the inverse of an energy. Gibbs, if you read his book, represents k sub t as something he calls theta. Having said that, we now have two pieces, and the first piece is to say we have a value for the statistical weight. And the value for the statistical weight for a system, we'll talk about what the systems are in a second, is some constant c, we will have much more to say about that in a bit, <coughs> times an exponential of minus beta times the energy of the system. And we also have, here's the sum over all of the states, and we give it a symbol Q. Okay? And the symbol Q is called the partition function. The symbol Q can also be written as e to the minus beta A. And what is A? A is the Helmholtz free energy. Helmholtz free energy is one of these thermodynamic things we will not discuss in detail in this course. Mm -hmm. Okay. The two things boxed in red are new laws of nature, like Maxwell's equations. You can't derive them from something else, or at least if you can, I have never seen an actual derivation or anything that appeared to be a legitimate derivation as opposed to someone pretending they had a derivation when they didn't. Okay, so having said there are two new laws of nature that are about to show up, let us discuss what Gibbs did. And what he did is to say, we are going to define something called an ensemble. An ensemble is a, is a collection of possible descriptions states of the system. And so the fundamental thing is the state. Now state is not a classical mechanics concept. You don't find it anywhere in classical mechanics except statistical mechanics. And what it is is the notion, suppose we take all of the atoms in this room and for some moment we record all of their positions and all of their momenta. 
that is a complete description of all of the atoms in the room from a mechanical standpoint. And if my recording of both positions and momenta was completely accurate, I can use those numbers to calculate where the atoms will move at all future times. Just as if I measure all of the positions of all of uh, the planets and how fast they're going and which way they're going, I can calculate planetary orbits for all future times. Now the statement can calculate is ideal because of the chaos challenge I mentioned last time. It's also, in fact, extremely difficult to do the calculation adequately, accurately, even with modern computers. But in principle, you can calculate. So, for a given instant in time, the state of the system is where all of the atoms are and how fast they're moving. Now, if the atom, like this book, has a shape, it could also be flipping on its axes and rotating, if it's flexible, it could also be vibrating, yes, but you might have to put in more detail because the molecule is made of atoms. Nonetheless, there is something called the state. Now, if we measure the pressure on the room at different times, we get different results. It's time dependent. That's the hiss the tiger always has in her ears. Well, so what we could imagine doing, in principle, is saying we don't like the result of one pressure measurement, let's look at a lot of them. And that would be an operational average. It could be we calculate the pressure on the wall of the room for a long time, it fluctuates up and down, and we take some average. It could be we build an extremely large number of exact copies of this building, put the right number of gas atoms in the room, and make one measurement per building of the gas pressure in the room. That would be an operational ensemble average. We talked about that last time for doing red blood cell counts. What Gibbs did is to say we're going to do an ideal version of this. And instead of somehow generating a sample of positions of atoms and momenta of atoms, we are going to generate a list of every possible state. An ensemble, now we come to the important definition, is a complete non-repeating list of all of the possible states of the system and the statistical weight assigned to each state. I'm letting you get that down even though it is in the book. Of course, I've introduced a new word when I said that. I introduced the word system. What do we mean by system? Well, we have a universe. And we shall divide the universe into two parts. And one of the parts is the system. And the rest of the, of the universe we call the bath. Now, the division between the system and the bath is a boundary and I have not told you anything about what the properties of the boundary are. It might let atoms pass in or out or it might not. It might be rigid or flexible. It might pass energy or not. <clears throat> However, <coughs> there is a boundary and lets us identify which atoms we are going to treat as the system. So far so good? So there's a system, and we have an ensemble which is a list of all possible states of the system. For quantum mechanics there is a, calcula there is a calculational issue which is actually you have to be very careful about something or you do something wrong and 
twice, and when you're done, you've reached the right answer. <coughs> this problem does not come up for statistical mechanics. So I've described the, st the system. Any system that can be treated by statistical mechanics has the property that it has an energy which we can calculate from those positions and momenta. Now you may say, is we can calculate it from the positions and momenta. Yeah, there's a kinetic energy of each atom. The atoms have potential energies which are functions of all of the positions. And in Cartesian coordinates, these stay nice and separate. The potential energy is not a function of how fast the atoms are moving. And the kinetic energy can be written entirely in terms of momenta without needing x's or y's or z's someplace in there. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we have a system. We have its description. We have its energy. And I said the ensemble. You must specify the statistical weight for that each state. What is the statistical weight for each state? It's the first of these equations. It's C e to the minus beta energy of the system. And what this tells you is that the larger the energy of the system, since beta is a constant and C is a constant, the larger the energy of the system, the less probable the system, maybe I should say the less probable that state is. So high energy states are less probable than low energy states. There are some other things going on at the same time. That does not, I did not tell you that high energy states as a group are less important than low energy states as a group, because it turns out there are a lot of high energy states and relatively few low energy states. You have now seen it's a new, po it's a new law of nature, a, uh, the basic postulate behind statistical mechanics. <clears throat> now, one important issue at this juncture is that there is another way to axiomatize statistical mechanics. And the other path for axiomatizing statistical mechanics is due to Boltzmann. Underlying that, before we get there, I said we have this boundary and it has features. The features are called constraints. If we are working in the Gibbs formulation of statistical mechanics, the constraints are called the canonical ensemble. The canonical ensemble is all of the states of the system that have exactly the right number of particles. The particles are confined to a fixed volume whose volume V we know. And we also know the temperature of the system T. So the canonical ensemble specifies N, V, and T. Now you might wonder, oh gee, um, we've specified where all the particles are and we've specified how fast they're moving. We can calculate any mechanical variable we want. Temperature is not a mechanical variable. It's an ensemble variable. Temperature appears in the theory in the character beta, which is inversely proportional to the temperature. So there is a temperature of the system. It enters here. It does not enter in your list of where the particles are or how fast they're going. <clears throat> and if I give you a single snapshot of the system, you cannot tell me what the temperature of the system is. You can make an estimate, and the estimate can be quite accurate, but that does, you cannot actually say this system must certainly be at temperature T. <clears throat> okay, what did Boltzmann do that was different? Boltzmann worked in what we would now call the microcanonical ensemble. The microcanonical ensemble, the boundary fixes the number of particles, it fixes the volume of the system, and it fixes the energy of the system. 
So the walls of the container do not allow energy to pass in or out. And therefore, N, V, and E are fixed. Well, if E is the same, for if we have a list of states of the system, and E is the same in all of them, yes? What does this tell us about the statistical weight of all of those states? It depends on temperature. Mm. No, there's no more temperature. It's gone. We fixed N, V, and E, not N, V, and T. That would make sense, but the answer is N, V, and E are the fixed quantities. What does this tell us about the statistical weights? Correct. The statistical weight of all Boltzmann states is the same. And so W, this W, J, is, it might as well be 1. Mm -hmm. my, my thought process was that N, V, <clears throat> and E are constant, so that the only thing left to, that, that can be varied in the expression there is T. Um, that's, well, actually, you have the same list of states at both temperatures. Okay. And so it gets a little messier than that, but no, the, there isn't actually a temperature in there. This is the, um, if we look at the list of all states of, with the same energy in the Gibbs canonical ensemble, they all have the same statistical weight. Now, this, their statistical weight as a part of the full canonical ensemble, this is where you were exactly correct, varies. Okay. But Boltzmann says we will only select for the ensemble the states with a given N, V, and E, <clears throat> and all of those states have equal weight. Oh, because if, yeah, okay, that makes sense, because if N, V, and E are the same, then T must be the same for all of them. T is not home at all. It's not there. Set it to 1, if you have to. Well, it vanishes, because W is just 1. Yeah. So there is no T at this level. You can compute a T, but um, there, is, there is no temperature variable, it's N, V, and E. It is also possible to work the other way, to start with the microcanonical ensemble. And so we have the microcanonical ensemble for a very large but finite volume. Finite is important. <coughs> and if the volume is extremely large but finite, the behavior of a small part of the system, in the limit the part is quite small, is the canonical ensemble behavior. So, this is what Gibbs did. Now, if you actually want to advance with this any further, there's some notation issues, and there's some conceptual issues. Uh, the f let me treat a few of more of the ensemble issues. First of all, there are a whole bunch of different ensembles that are discussed in the book. For example, there is the isobaric ensemble in which the walls are flexible, and you go through all of the canonical ensembles with different volumes. And you sort out of all of those ensembles all of the states of the system where the pressure is the same and you throw out all of the states of the system from all of these ensembles of different volume where the pressure is wrong. And now you have an ensemble of where there are n particles, they're at temperature T, the pressure is exactly P, and this is called the isothermal, same temperature, isobaric, same volume ensemble. The Equal energy ensemble is also called the isodynamic equal energy ensemble. Isodynamic? Yes. That's varying energy? Equal energy? Yes. Oh, okay, it's yeah. the same as microcanonical. There is also, we will get to it in this course, the grand canonical ensemble. The grand canonical ensemble. It treats the existence of doorways. You know, this room. Atoms can move in and out. The canonical ensemble does not describe this because it's fixed volume. Okay.
So there are different ensembles. Now we come to two bits which you should be aware of since you will probably take another step mech course at some time. The first is something called the representative ensemble. In the, represent, the representative ensemble looks sort of like the canonical ensemble. However, in the representative ensemble, instead of having every possible state of the system, you have a random collection of states, a very large random collection. You, you imagine the canonical ensemble is an infinite filing cabinet full of pictures and you reach in and draw out pictures at random. However, in the representative ensemble, the statistical weight of each state is 1, but you're allowed to draw out multiple copies of the same state. So this weighting factor becomes the likelihood of finding a particular state and this x minus beta e shows up because there are more copies of low energy systems than high energy systems. <clears throat> okay. That makes sense. Now you should realize that if it's actually representative and every state is not there, that, and you think carefully about how real numbers work, there are some serious problems which get glossed over. The other thing you may encounter is people who will say that in the canonical ensemble, the statistical weight is 1. That's simply not true. You can find, if you go through the textbook literature enough, you will find people claiming it, and they're just wrong. The third bit you will find um, is assertions that you can derive either of these statistical weights from something similar. And I go through the discussion of that in the book. The key issue is that, for example, you could say, well, all states should be equally likely, the principle of equal a priori probabilities. <coughs> that assumption is correct for the microcanonical ensemble. It's false for the canonical ensemble. But there is absolutely nothing in this assertion, well, they all have to be equally likely because there's nothing telling them apart, there's nothing to tell you which ensemble you're in, so the argument is just wrong. Uh, I regularly look for people claiming a derivation of the statistical weight. I have never found one that actually made sense. Okay, so that's statistical weights, and we are now done almost with Chapter 3. There is one last bit of Chapter 3, though, and this is a matter of notation. And the issue is, <clears throat> we want to represent symbolically where all the atoms in the container are and how fast they're moving. And we sort of start out, and we have an X, a Y, and a Z. And if there were only one atom, you know, like physics one, where there's only one particle, this works just fine. And we realize X and Y and Z could be replaced with a vector R, that's a vector, which is the position vector of the particle. And similarly, the particle has momentum components, px, py, and pz, but momentum is a vector, we can represent it as capital P. Okay, you know, there's more than one atom in the room since you can hear me speaking. We know there must be a lot of atoms or sound waves would not propagate. Also, we would have asphyxiated. And so what we do is to say, we will take these coordinates, x, y, z, and we will put little subscripts on them. So here is atom 1, x1, y1, z1, and that is position of atom 1. So far so good. And having said that, we do the same for momentum. So there's a px1, a p1y, a p1z. I tried in the book to be consistent in always writing the number and the uh, coordinate direction in the same order, and I'm fairly sure I missed one someplace. <coughs> but you should realize the momentum components have two labels, one telling you which component, X, Y, Z, and the other telling you which atom. 
And so we can represent atom 1 like this, and we could do atom 2 the same way, and so forth. The third piece of G, the notation is going to get messy, is we are going to have N, capital N, atoms in the room. Capital N is rather large. It's Avogadro's number. <clears throat> and capital P is rather large. It's also Avogadro's number. <clears throat> well, having said capital R and capital P large, if we have something that's a function of all of the position coordinates, writing them all down might get messy if I don't have to sort them out. And so we introduce R vector superscript N and P vector superscript N. And those are symbols. And they stand for the set of all the position coordinates and the set of all of the momentum coordinates. And by the way, there are N of them. It's sort of natural notation if you approach it one step at a time. Now we do the same thing for positions and momenta. And suppose we are going to integrate over a volume. We're going to integrate over all of the places that atom 1 could be in the volume. So atom 1 has coordinates x1, y1, z1. And if we want to integrate over all of the places that is, we want to write down a list of all of the places the atom could be in the volume, and we want to sum it up. The, um, we get an integral, dx1, dy1, dz1. Well, you don't want to write those down more than you have to. We will have to sometime. So we replace that with a dr vector 1. What does the integral dr vector mean? Well, a vector is just a symbol for the three scalars, and so dr vector 1 means we're integrating over the three positions, and dp1 means we're integrating over the three momenta. And you may correctly guess that when there are n atoms in the room, we might write a dr superscript n to mean we're adding up over all of the positions of all of the atoms in the room. <clears throat> So far, so good. Okay, that's it for chapter three. Is, the cam is there a picture still there? Yep. Good. It shut down this morning, and I lost an hour and a half of polymer science lecture. Okay, having said that, <clears throat> we can now advance to talking about doing an ensemble average. And the ensemble average is like every other average. There's a quantity we're going to average. There's a sum over all possible states. There's the quantity being averaged. And there's the statistical weight. And downstairs, there's this normalizing factor. And I introduce the symbol Q for that, the partition function. The other thing I did is to say Q is e to the minus beta A. Now, what is the point of that? Well, we're doing statistical mechanics, so we're calculating things like pressures. However, there is another field of science that is also interested in pressures called thermodynamics. Uh, and thermodynamics has results like PV equals NRT, the ideal gas law. And the pressure P there and the force on the wall of the room are related, but the relationship is not trivial. What Gibbs did was to specify an exact relationship between statistical mechanics and thermodynamics and the exact relationship is this normalizing factor <coughs> links to what is called the Helmholtz free energy. Okay, we're not going to do a thermo course. This is really a stat mech course. But I will explain very briefly what the free energies are. The free energies, so what are free energies? The free energy is the energy available to do work under a particular set of circumstances. The Helmholtz free energy, A, is the energy available to do work if you keep the volume and the temperature fixed. 
A more important to practical synthetic chemist free energy is the Gibbs free energy. Gibbs was apparently a very modest man and he probably would have been horrified to discover that the free energy at constant pressure and temperature is G, the Gibbs free energy. He had a different symbol for it and did not attach a name to it. And the Gibbs free energy tells you how much energy is available for work at constant pressure and temperature. Now where might you get constant pressure and temperature? Well, you run a chemical reaction in a, a beaker and you start out at room temperature and you end up in room temperature and in between reactions have gone on. And if you were able to pull energy out as work, you may not have done that. You may have turned the work into heat and the vessel got hot in the meantime and the heat flowed out. The reaction flows spontaneously in that direction. A if A goes downhill, that is, if you could take work out, here's a set of reactants, here's a set of products, and you can take work out while holding the volume and temperature constant, um, that says the reaction proceeded this way, and you could take work out, and then to move the reaction the other way, you have to put the work back in to separate the products into the reactants. <clears throat> now the statement we are going to hold the volume or the pressure constant is not trivial. Holding the pressure constant in a typical chemical reaction is fairly easy as long as the pressure is one atmosphere. You're working under a hood. The apparatus is not pressure sealed. The pressure is one atmosphere quite close. There are people who want to do reactions at constant volume which often means the pressure changes a lot. And there are special chemical devices called pressure set, high pressure cells for doing this. And they're made of simple flexible materials like inch and a half thick stainless steel plate. And you run the reaction and it may be highly exothermic. And the pressure may be quite large in between. But since you are holding the volume constant, and the pressure is quite large, that shifts the equilibrium of chemical reactions in particular ways. Now there's another fe there are two other features of free energies. We aren't going to do this. The first is if you have one fr any one free energy as a, fu as a function, say, of its natural variables, like A, which is naturally a function of volume and temperature, you have all of the free energies, because you can calculate each from all of the others, and you have all other thermodynamic quantities, specific heats, chemical potentials, whatever you want. If you have one free energy over its whole variable space, you know all of the thermodynamic properties of the system. That's point one. That's why they're useful. Any one of them is useful. Point two. I said A is a function of V and T. You notice it corresponds to the, and it's also a function of how much matter is there if we don't divide that out and find the molar free energy, which is what a chemist would usually do. The other thing we can say is that um, you don't have to write A as a function of V and T because thermodynamic variables are interchangeable uh, as long as they're independent. And instead of writing A as a function of V and T, which would be the natural behavior, you could write it as function of, say, pressure and temperature, or pressure and volume, and you can make these conversions. And once upon a time, I did a paper with Dan Kivelson, which was extremely important to do this. And we had the assistance of Bob Scott, who was a very good thermodynamicist, and it was the hardest calculation in terms of how the heck do we get this to work that I have ever done in my life. And all three of us said the other two guys had done most of the work because we hadn't done very much. So in any event, I have talked about free energies. I have brought us to the end of chapter three. Next time, for next time, please skim chapter four. You probably won't follow all of it the first time because you are about to see for the, possibly for the first time in your life a six-dimensional integral. And once you're led through it, oh, that's trivial. But the first time you see it, it's quite imposing. 
We are now done. Class dismissed. I have another class to get to.